Howdy there. It's Jonathan L. Hugh Klein from Get the Picks Productions, and Westerns are going to be what we're talking about today. Uh, specifically, Westerns made by Travis Mills. Travis Mills did 12 Westerns in 12 months, and then was brought on as an expert for a film you might have heard of called Terror on the Prairie, where he was a cameraman, co-producer, and a stuntman who got beat up by Cowboy Cerrone, another name you might have heard of. Today, we will ask him all the big questions. What led him to this point in his life? What are those gaps like between making a small budget film and making a big budget film? And if Nick Searcy is hot? Yeah, that is one of the questions. Let's tune in. So let's welcome to the show, Travis Mills. Welcome, Travis. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I see you have a severed head on the shelf behind you. How'd that come yeah, about? I, How's that I decided to scoot over so that you can see the <laughs> severed head that's currently wearing my straw hat. That's uh, my my fake head from the movie I made, The Wilderness Road, okay. where my character gets his head cut off. Spoiler alert. So I kept it as a souvenir. Sometimes I use it in acting classes as like, an example of, you know, give the right eye line and all that. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You also did a ton of work on a film called Terror on the Prairie. Co-producer, cameraman, actor, stuntman. Any other jobs I missed from Terror on the Prairie? Chicken Wrangler, Baby Wrangler. Uh, <laughs> Chicken Wrangler. Let me write that one down. Yeah, Chicken so basically, the director on that film, Michael Polish, nicknamed me the Swiss Army Knight <laughs> because I kind of just did whatever they needed me to do. I started off as a Western consultant. That's why they hired me. Um, and then uh, they uh, you know, kind of moved me into different areas wherever they needed me. And that was the biggest budgeted project I've ever worked on. And so before that, you had a ton of experience making indie features when you did 12 Westerns in 12 months. And is that then how you were seen as the expert and were brought in? Because I think a lot of people think that how it goes is, oh, I'm going to make a movie. It's going to be so good that Hollywood's going to hear about me. They're going to call me up and then I'm going to become a famous person. Is, is that how it works or how did it go for you? Well, what you're kind of talking about is what I saw a lot in film school, what I've run into over the years as well. It's kind of the Sundance myth. I'm going to make this one film. It's going to hit the big festivals, and then I'm going to break out. The, the reason people think that is because it has happened to a few select, talented, and I think very lucky individuals. Most of us have a much harder path to get there. And that whole kind of idea never appealed to me. What made sense to me was make lots of films, do the work, learn from your mistakes. You're going to make them. It's inevitable. You're going to make them and uh, try to get better as you go and just develop your craft. And I love the work. I just love making movies. Right. So if I can do it in a sustainable way, I just want to continue telling stories and making movies. Uh, if I end up on a higher level, fantastic. But but the main goal is to actually just tell the stories. Right. Um, so that's how I approached it. Obviously, the 12 Westerns is kind of the epitome of that to make 12 feature length movies in 12 months. And I picked a great year for it, global pandemic and all that. We did it right, in 2020. Right, right. But that, that, you know, I wrote a whole book about that experience, which people can check out. And, and people, some people that read that book say this, this is a great book for young filmmakers because yeah, yeah. it really shows you the nitty gritty stuff you're going to get into when you make a movie um, that they don't teach you in film school. But yeah, so when I made those films is when I actually reached out to Dallas Sanye, the, the main producer, yep. mastermind of Terror on the Prairie. And I, uh, he was getting attacked at the time in the media. And I just emailed him and I said, Dallas, you're making the best movies out there. I love your work. I always have your back. And I told him a little bit about the 12 Westerns and he, he wrote back and he was like, 12 Westerns, you crazy? <laughs> and then uh, we kind of kept talking from there. And then, you know, he thought, well, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert, but he thought based on this guy's experience, I think we need him That's on the team. Great. That's great. That's great. And then um, in addition to that, do you fold your pizza when you eat it? No. No. Okay. Well, Definitively no. <laughs> Definitively no. Okay. Well... Afterwards, in addition to your book, I also noticed you wrote a blog post that seemed uh, to be along the lines of why I, and again, I'm paraphrasing, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it was almost like why I never want to make a low-budget Western ever again. <laughs> um, 
now that you can really, you're right in that area of your life where you're, you can kind of compare the differences. What are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of some of the different areas? Well, you got to keep in mind that I started this in 2010. Like I said, I've done 26 features. I've done over 100 shorts. So it's not wow. like I made one or two low-budget films and said, oh, I'm, I'm done with that. I want to move on. I, I really have, have done that thing for a significant amount of time. Yeah. And recently with the Westerns, what you're really trying to do, especially with the one I was writing about in the essay that you mentioned, I mean, we've got two giant shootouts, one horse chase, a big fist fight. You're not making a Western set in one room. It's mm -hmm. got more action than Tarantino's Hateful Eight wow. easily. You know, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm trying to make films for $20,000 that really should be made for at least $500,000. Right, and right. Probably more. Right. And that is where you start to really come up against some, you're just, you feel blocked. Yeah. You feel limited if right. you do it enough times. Working on Terra on the Prairie, the real thing I took away from that was, and, and I will be the first to say it, um, it's not like we had a perfect crew. There's always some weak links on a crew. Right, right. But I was able to work with some incredibly talented individuals, an yeah. Oscar-winning makeup artist, a, a great stunt coordinator who, who allowed me to do some of the best stunts in the film, and all kinds of some great camera people. And, you know, after that experience, you say, you know, I really want to... It's not that I want a crew of 50 people. It's one I want a crew of the 10 best people. How do I do that? And that's kind of where just where I am in my career. How do I work with uh, every single movie I've ever made? I've had to work with actors who are inexperienced, yeah. who had never worked before. Right. And it's a fulfilling um, it's a fulfilling process because you give those three people an opportunity. Yeah. But sometimes the work feels uneven because of some really good performances, some okay performances, right. some not so okay performances. Right. So you get to a point where you're like, I just want to work with quality. Right. It's not so much right. money. It's just, you want quality. It's, it's, so that's, it's kind of like high noon where it's just like filming is just like high noon. It's just kind of like you have this deadline coming and, uh, <laughs> and you're just like walking around town trying to get people to help you. And some people are like, Hey, I'm here. I'm excited about this. And they find out that there's not that many people there. So then they bail on you. And then you end up having to, uh, your wife ends up having to bail you out. And then, uh, the exactly. whole town shows up right at the end. And that's when you almost want to throw your badge into the ground and leave. Um, it's, it's kind of like that for sure. And it's interesting to hear that even at level you're at to where you're you know, you're making a ton of different projects, you still feel that. So do you think that's a, um, and it sounds like you're saying that even flows into some of the bigger budget ones as well. Do you feel like that's the case or, or, or not? Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, I, I think that realistically, a lot of people think if I get this big budget, it's going to solve all my problems. If you listen to the Roger Deakins podcast, I mean, this is the guy that shot Skyfall, No Country for Old Men. He and his wife has an, have an incredible podcast mm. that, where they interview everyone from gaffers to key grips that they've worked oh, with that's for great. years. You, you can tell from their, their uh, experience that even on multi, multi-million dollar films, there's still so many issues. The issues never go away. Some of the pro problem people never go away mm. because because of one word, people. There's always going to be people involved, <laughs> which means there's going to be good people, great people, okay yeah. people, and then terrible people. Um, but I think that when you have more money, you have more control, and you do have the ability to be more selective. Whereas mm. if you're working with the $20,000 budget, you're saying, well, I've got two, three choices, maybe one or two choices, maybe just one choice sometimes. Right, right. right. And uh, it just limits your options, okay. I think. Well, on, in that same vein of questioning, uh, Nick Searcy, hot or not? Hot or not? Yeah. What you... <laughs> you know what? This Nick is a very is serious hot. question. This is he's the one I'm most serious about. Nick Searcy definitely thinks he's hot. <laughs> and. Uh, I, I think he was hot when he did fried green tomatoes back in the day, and they, they ate him as barbecue in the movie. But um, 
you know, uh, he's a really good actor. He's his performance. I don't know if you've seen the movie. It, it really carries the film. So yeah, that's so. awesome. No, he's a very talented guy. Um, even too, I'm like watching Moneyball the other night. I'm like, oh, there he is. And I'm like, why didn't they give him more lines? He should talk. So more. I asked him about Moneyball. Yeah, okay. And I won't share too much, but. He oh, yeah. said that the the way that they did that film was so chaotic because mm. there was no there was really no script, right. and and the lines were just kind of being thrown around in an improvised way. And he kind of left the production thinking, um, "This is not going to cut together." <laughs> and then you see the movie, and you're like, "Whoa!" Right? Yeah. So then I've had that experience too, where you see something on set. And you're like, that's not going to work. Right. And then oh, you see the finished film and you're like, I was wrong. I was way wrong. And of course, it goes the other way too, where you think something will work and it really doesn't. Yeah. So things kind of going right and things kind of going wrong that you wouldn't expect. And you just kind of be able to maneuver and adjust to those things. I think this is one of the things I wanted to make sure that, uh, that I talked to you about. Because personally, I feel like I make films because I don't communicate as well as I would like to. So that moment of getting to see people in a theater reacting to my ideas on screen as close as I can get them visually, that's what's fulfilling for me. You have this huge drive. I mean, I, 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 it's, that's a lot of movies. That's a lot of movies to do in general. That's, you know, that's, you know, Tarantino's doing 10 total. Like you've done 12 in a, in a year or two years. That's insane. That's a ton of drive. That's, that's a very unique individual that can do something like that. So many people I see give up on their first project, writing their first project, the idea stage, and then they'll tell you that all they wanted to do was be a filmmaker. And it seems like zero efforts going into it, just speaking bluntly. How, what is the thing that, that pushes you to be able to continue working? Well, one thing that's to my benefit is I'm not a perfectionist. Hmm. I see oftentimes perfectionists getting stalled because they want everything to be perfect. And I want to do my best, learn from my mistakes, and move on. I think a lot of people overthink their scripts, overthink their production, let, let money stand in the way, let equipment stand in the way. They put too much pressure on their first project. My first project has to be great. Right, right. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be great. You just need to go. You know, there was a young man in, uh, from Texas working on Terror on the Prairie, and uh, he just said, how do I make the jump from short films to my first feature? Yeah. I go, you just do it. <laughs> yeah. You just write a script and you just go make it in a week. And it doesn't matter if it's terrible because you got it out of your system. You've made your first feature. It's done. Mm -hmm. and you, you've done it. And uh, I think about six months later, he went out and did it. So good for him. That's right. Um, so that's the attitude that I had is just don't overthink it. If you want to tell the story, just go out and make it happen. Don't let money stand in your way. Don't, don't let don't let any of that stuff stand in your way. And I feel like you had a second part to your question. And I, and I no, I mean, it. what is it that then uh, – what then is, is the thing inside of you that pushes you to – being that way, you know, because I feel like um, some people yeah. do get shut down in their first one. The perfectionist, I mean, uh, for a lot of times, if I were going to write the character for them, I would say it's probably that moment of they cannot sit there and watch have have people react to a film that they made that they know is not perfect, right? It's that moment that they're afraid of. So they'll a lot of times get it close and then never release it, which is the thing that's like, I'm like, you did all the work, <laughs> just let it go, and they won't do yeah. that. Yeah, well, my mom. The best thing my mom ever told me my whole life is that the day after I wrapped my first feature film, I was already talking about my second feature film. And that told her that I was serious about this. Oh, that's Cause great. Because it, it clearly it was just something I was just in love with. Because yeah. I just, I, I didn't even take a day to bask in the glory. I was already just like, and the next movie I'm going to make is this <laughs> and then this. So, and, and in terms of releasing films, sometimes it is tough. Sometimes it's embarrassing. I mean, I, there's films that, that I've, I've released and you're cringing at some of the mistakes you made and, and some of the performances. And yeah, I, I very rarely watch my films when they play in a theater. I usually go to the bar and have five beers or two whiskeys and then come <laughs> back and do the Q and a, I mean, it's, it's not, 
it's not something you would I necessarily enjoy unless wow. it's a comedy. Okay. Yeah. But the problem is with a comedy, it's nice because you can hear people's reactions. Yep. 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 Or not, or not. But you yep. can at least tell if it's working. And with a drama, a lot of my films are dramatic. You're sitting there and you're like, I have no idea if this is working or not. You know? Um, yeah. That's very true. Go, <laughs> yeah. We you did. go for the Q and A. And then you say, any questions? And no one has a question. You're like, this is terrible. Um, and then you go home and the next day you start working on your next film, you know? That's great. Um, yeah. Yeah. So That's it, the attitude it, to have. Yeah, That's for it, sure. It, can, it is the attitude to have, but it's. It, I understand that it's not easy. And I'm not the only one. Uh, big time professionals don't watch their work and struggle with the process of putting it out there and reacting to it. And I've heard so many of my favorite directors say, no, I've, I haven't watched it since I made it. You know, I wouldn't want to. Um, so that that is a process. But what drives me is the work itself. And I think mm -hmm. I would at this point. I was talking about this with my mentor a little bit today. We started the company together 10, 12 years ago is, um, do you really love the work mm -hmm. or do you love having, like, do you, do you love that you have done it? Meaning, are you wanting to go through the process of making a film, acting in a film, right. writing a film, or do you just want to have had, this finished screenplay, yeah. this finished film. Right. Are you are you more interested in the red carpet or are you more interested in being sweaty and dirty on set on day eight and you haven't slept and you're on your third energy drink? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, which one are you most interested in? Because mm -hmm. for me, it's the work itself. But I think a lot of people really, they're, they're really in it for the results. And that yeah. might be also why they don't finish what they do and they don't even make it to the field. They don't even play right. because they really have no appetite for the process. Yeah. No, I think that's great. And I think that brings up one specific that I think uh, you even mentioned in another interview that you struggled with early on was the results that you do need to bring. The minimum of the results that you do need to bring is that you're, you know, have a system that's not losing you money, right? Because if you're losing money, you can't buy more paint, you can't paint more, you know, art, you can't make more art, it's, it's done. That's another big thing that I think people struggle with as well. What was the thing that you think clicked in you that kind of made that switch to like, oh, this is, I need to not just make movies, I need to make a system for making movies? Well, so I started off making these, that you can't even call them micro budget because. <laughs> These definitions are constantly changing. What's in my know? wallet budget? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I made five or six features or, yeah, somewhere around in there. They were just for nothing, nice. right? Nice. And then started to be able to get true investors and then maybe grew a little bit too quickly. Went from a $10,000 movie to the biggest budgeted film I've directed to date, which was a $200,000 movie. Whoa. With some... some um, uh, recognizable faces, Tom Sizemore, a famous director, Peter Bogdanovich, played a role in it. The name so of that anyway, movie? What was the name of that movie? That you it's called Durant's Never Closes. It's okay. about a restaurant in Phoenix, Arizona that's historic and kind of connected to the mafia. Um, but so I, I put all my eggs in one basket. I'd, I'd already made a lot of films. I'd, yeah. I'd made over 50 short films. I'd made a few features. So it wasn't like I was inexperienced. Right. But I grew maybe a little too quickly. Mm. And it was my first time working without much money. I think I handled the production well. Right. But I didn't realize how difficult it was to make money back on a film that had recognizable people in it. It's yeah. not that simple. The yeah. distribution world is very complicated. And to make a long story short, we didn't make anything on that movie. Wow. It bombed. I had a bad distribution deal. Um, they didn't make me any money. Um, it just didn't do well. I played it. I tried to play it all over the country. Right. And, you know, I really put, put my best foot forward. But um, And then none of those people would ever invest with me ever again, wow. obviously. Wow, wow, wow. So, now, at the same time, there's a second part to this. I was asked to make a film in Mississippi just a few months after that. And I said, sure, it's my mom's hometown. 
I went there and I made a movie for $15,000 and I made the money back for the investors the night of the premiere. Oh, wow. That's great. That's the idea. So <laughs> I saw there and then I was able to double down and a lot of those investors put more money in my next project and so on and so forth. Wow. So I saw there, I'm like, okay, what I did with Durant's was not sustainable. Mm, I almost, okay. I almost blew my whole career on one movie. Oh, what I, I did with this small Mississippi movie, Porches and Private Eyes, now I have something to show for it. I've made a profit. I right. work off of that. And I try to um, continue along that path. And that hasn't been a foolproof system either. But I've had some profitable movies. The problem is the industry is constantly changing. Yeah. Constantly have to adapt to... You know, Amazon's profitable for filmmakers one year, and then the next year it's not. <laughs> they don't want you like, on there. <laughs> then they make yeah, up yeah. reasons. We had a film, actually, that we made. We're here in Ohio, so most of our viewers on Amazon were from Ohio. Then the other half, and some months it was more people watching it, in the UK. For some reason, the UK really was connecting with this film. They were watching it and interacting with the film and actually watching film. more of a majority of the movie than people in America. So we were like, this is really weird. And I'm thinking it was just because they were fascinated by the idea of a bunch of American kids running around with guns. And they just thought that was <laughs> such a unique thing. But then randomly we were like doing great. And then all of a sudden the, uh, Amazon came up with some reason. That same time, I, I think a few people called it like the indie purge. They just ripped a bunch of films off. And they, it was a bunch of different uh, reasons and a bu that they gave. Ours, they were saying, oh, you need to say that you're from the United States. And, well, you've already mailed me stuff. You know I'm from there. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty weird stuff. But now I'm guessing you're you're doing a lot of your stuff through Tubi. Um, any other right. distribution things? Yeah, just a quick segue, you know, about Amazon again. In 2018, I released a Western on there that we made for $50,000, mm -hmm. and we made back our entire budget in three months of wow. Amazon numbers. Wow. They, you can't do that anymore. It's over. Right. They 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 don't take good content, or they don't take indie content, and even before they stopped taking the content, they kept lowering the royalties <laughs> until it was almost impossible. Um, they were like, leave, so, leave. <laughs> yeah, so n now Tubi is is the profitable one, and my 12 Westerns, at least most of them, are making good amount of revenue for the investors on Tubi. But the thing is, I was telling someone the other day, if we made a movie today, mm -hmm. I could not guarantee that by the time we released it, Tubi would still be the profitable system, right? Because right. it's constantly changing. Right. So you've got to just tell people it's evolving and we have to do the best in the situation that we're in. That's great. That's great. Um, what movie would you uh, watch for the first time again? What's if you could watch some movie, but it's the first time. Does that make sense? That's a weirdly worded it question. It does make sense. Okay, good. <laughs> Shoot, man. That's tough. I'm just going to say what comes to mind good. is Blade Runner. The original oh, yeah. Blade Runner. Okay. You know. All right. That would that would be a cool first-time experience. I, I think I saw it for the first time when I was 12 or something and didn't quite appreciate it. So if I could watch it for the first time now, yeah. I think I would just be like – you know, have to not do anything for several days. <laughs> Those are the great it. movies. Those are the great movies when you finish it and you're still like kind of in that world afterwards. That's a totally. pretty amazing thing. Um, okay. What are the next big steps you feel like in your life that you're pushing towards? We're micro. The ones where you were like, we had like no money at all. That's where we're at. That's our stage. <laughs> so where do you feel like, because I think you're at a very interesting part of your career that not a lot of people talk about because they're either the really big, big shots that don't know how to explain anything to anybody getting started out, <laughs> or they are to the point at which they are so little that they don't know anything about the process. I think you're right there to where you've worked on huge stuff. You've done a ton of different work for the indie side of things. So I think you've got that very well down. <laughs> so what's the, uh, what do you feel like? What's the next goal that you're pushing towards uh, internally? Yeah, it may be a multi, uh, multi-directed answer so on one level for the first time in my career i'm really opening myself up to working on other people's films whether it be dallas's projects like terra on the prairie getting hired as a i just got hired as a producer on this film in kentucky nice so i'll announce that this coming um this upcoming friday um, but really excited about about that so i'm opening myself up to that i didn't want to do any of that before yeah. i was like 
my movies, my way. That's what I'm doing. Don't get in my way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now I'm like, you know what? Experience other people's productions. You know, pour yourself out a little bit, Travis. You know? <laughs> um, make a little money so you don't have to live in a shack. Um, so, um, but the other answer to your question is, you know, just creatively, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on writing. Mm-hmm. See, seeing, uh, I look back at my films and say one of the weak elements that I can change is the writing. Mm. I didn't focus enough on characters, character development. I'm trying to become a better writer. Part of that is developing this uh, series. I've never done a series before. Okay. So after the twelve westerns, I thought that would be the next challenge—a western show. Yeah. So probably would work out great for uh, for a Tubi audience too, especially if you got ads running, multiple different episodes, means more time, more ads for the same project. Exactly. That's a great idea. Yeah. We're excited about it and taking that to a budget level that hopefully I can work with that Academy Award winning makeup artist, still a small team, but a good team. Yeah. And then, you know, the last part of your question is like, even just today, pushing to try that to make my next feature film, uh, it'd be on a higher level. And I don't know what that budget level is. I don't know if it's 200,000 again. I don't know if it's (laughs) maybe even more. It would be great. And again, the number is not important. It's just having more options and, and, and being able to work with the right people. That's great. That's great. And last big question just to round things out. Um, famous childhood crush. Okay. My famous Like celebrity crush. crush as a child. <laughs> I'm going to disappoint every audience member who's <laughs> watching this, especially if they're All younger. five of them. <laughs> you guys are all young, I think, compared to me, so you probably don't even know who these people are. But So I was born in the 80s. I love Oh my age. gosh, that's so old. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I know, it's terrible, <laughs> right? But I, I happen to be just crazy about the 80s. So my two crushes would be Madonna in the 80s. Not now. <laughs> not now. It's a very different not person. Post, <laughs> not post-1995, let's say. You know, Madonna. And then an actress named Deborah Winger, who's super Deborah kind Winger. of like my nerdy crush. She's my nerdy crush. Oh, but I she's see. from the 80s again, from the 80s. Deborah Winger. What was she in? Terms of Endearment, Officer and a Gentleman, Urban Cowboy. Wow. Madonna's like my lusty crush, and <laughs> and Deborah Winger's like my in love crush. <laughs> That's who you, you could the, you could marry and bring home to mom. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Madonna, I would not bring home to mom. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Okay. Well, thank you again, Travis Mills, guys. Go check out um, pretty much any of the projects that you have. Yeah, basically the best way is to follow me on Instagram, Travis Mills, I think underscore filmmaker. I don't even know my own handle. Look at that. Um, look, you'll look find up the it. Twelve Westerns. You know, honestly, the best the best way to support go to Tubi, put in my name, Travis Mills, and you're gonna find like 15 features to watch. Pick one and stream it. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking to us. And uh, hopefully some of you uh, indie filmmakers have gotten some inspiration to be able to go out there and make films. And then if you get to, if you're good enough, you can make a film with Travis. So have a good day, guys. Signing out. Signing out.